Well, welcome to everyone. Conversation at the Crossroads, which is hosting the event, extends its warmest welcome to all of you. In the spirit of reconciliation and justice, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country in Australia, a unique connection to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present, and future. In the same spirit, we pay our respects to all indigenous peoples everywhere who have suffered dispossession. Conversation at the Crossroads is a new initiative. It's committed to vigorous but respectful dialogue on the vital issues that will shape the human future. We oppose racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, xenophobia in all its forms. I am Joseph Camilleri, and what a privilege it is to share this platform with two long-standing friends, deeply engaged, distinguished intellectuals, Richard Falk, Stuart Rees, to discuss two remarkable books, Richard Falk's Public Intellectual, a penetrating account of a life lived to the full, where the personal and the political seamlessly merge. And Stuart Rees's Cruelty or Humanity, imaginative blending of historical detail and rich ethical insights of engaging prose and moving poetry. This, I should mention, is no mutual admiration society. There will be some rather probing questions coming up. And joining us in this conversation are Professor Hilary Charlesworth, Dr. Punam Yadav, Dr. Hanana Shrawi, Dr. Chandra Muzaffar, Professor Amin Saikal, and uh, regretfully, uh, Professor Rafael Marchetti has been called away on urgent university business, cannot be with us. And uh, even more regrettably still, uh, Ms. Kurti Jayakamura, who was Jayakumar, I should say, who was uh, meant to join us from India, has just informed me that she's gone through two weeks of hell through COVID, having caught, the, having been infected, and is only now beginning to recover. We wish her a speedy and full recovery. For all our panelists, uh, only the briefest introductions. I regret to say, but uh, their photos and detailed, bio, bi uh, detailed bios have been sent to all registrants, at least for, to those who registered as of yesterday. So in this event, uh, we are very much concerned with a big picture, uh, because that is in many ways the focus of both books. Of course, they deal with specific events, personalities and experiences. Uh, but they are also concerned with the big picture and how the various pieces of the jigsaw puzzle connect and reinforce each other. So let me turn to our two authors. Academics, yes. Intellectuals, yes. Uh, but also passionate advocates, often to be found in the trenches of public debate and political conflict, often at considerable cost to themselves. Professor Stuart Rees, uh, Emeritus Professor Sydney University, was Professor of Social Work and Social Policy for about 20 years, uh, a passionate advocate for justice, uh, a pioneer in the development of peace and conflict studies, uh, founder of the Sydney Peace Foundation and its prestigious Sydney, Sydney Peace Prize, and author of many books other than the one we're discussing this evening. And Professor Richard Falk, well, a legend really, a professor of international law and social relations at Princeton's for some 40 years, uh, involved in so many different projects, campaigns, uh, investigations, special projects, UN related and much else. And the author of uh, not too many books to mention, just too many books to count. Well over 50 books and innumerable, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> innumerable uh, 
academic articles, uh, essays, opinion pieces, and much else. So to begin, the question to both of you, <clears throat> why another book? Why this book and why now? What is it that has driven the two of you to write these two books at this time? What is it you most want to convey to the reader? Richard, over to you first. Well, that's a tough question to begin with. Uh, let me proceed it by thanking uh, Crossroads for uh, convening this event and for all that are participating. I feel very honored by participating with Stuart and by having this opportunity to meet with you all. Um, I mean, why now? If I didn't do it now, it would be hard to imagine doing it later. So <laughs> this was the last possible moment, I think, when I approached my 90th birthday, uh, that I could take account of my life. Maybe I waited too long, uh, but I, and, and it's rather treacherous when you get to be that age uh, to rely uh, totally on memory. I, I didn't consult any journals, transcripts, articles, books, uh, but for better and worse, I relied on what I could remember. And it would have been a different book had it uh, tried to take account of, in a more accurate and comprehensive way of some of these experience that, experiences that I had over the years. But what I wanted to do most of all was to uh, understand the connections between the personal, the political, the professional, and the activist sides of the life I chose to lead, and uh, a life that was different than most of the people I knew growing up. They people didn't follow that path, and what, when I was in academic life also, uh, I found very few uh, what one would call comrades, people willing to agree with me, not only at cocktail parties, but at demonstrations. See, and that was the cutoff. The, lots of, there are lots of brave liberals within university life, but there are very few who overcome academic timidity to take a active engagement in controversial issues and subject their scholarship to normative criteria, to what might be called a genre of advocacy scholarship, which goes against the traditional notions of neutrality and objectivity. Should I say more or should I? Uh, give way to Stuart. I'm, I'm happy to follow Richard, um, Joe, if that's a good idea at this point. Yes, by all means. Okay. Well, look, first of all, I'm thrilled to bits to be on the same screen as Richard, and uh, we, uh, we both owe enormous gratitude to you, Joe, and your colleagues for ensuring that we can have this dialogue at this crucial time to imagine a better world. Because everywhere I go, every, almost every person I speak to has a sense of urgency about what that uh, might look like. And uh, there's a sense of fear too, that the reference to going back to normal may be the best way to ensure that nothing very uh, justice-like happens. In terms of... Um, why I came to write this book at this time, it was a sense, I think, of, of outrage um, at uh, injustice to asylum seekers, to the people of Palestine, to indigenous people all over the world, to vulnerable women and children. And um, a concern that 
particularly in 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 universities, that too, too many academics are uh, lions in the classroom, but lambs on the streets, and um, that the issue of having the courage of your convictions uh, gives me a sense of urgency about what to do, how to express that outrage, and thereby, in Stefan Hessel's famous terms, stay in touch with your own um, humanity. Now that's that's my quick response to to your question. Unmute, please, Joe. Joe, do you want to? We should all be muting, except those who are speaking, uh, which is me at the moment. Um, and I did forget to unmute myself a moment ago. My apologies. Uh, so a question to you, uh, Richard. Um, through the book, you mention nothing more than once uh, that... Um, Though you have lived life to the full and enjoyed much of it, nevertheless, as you reflect, there is a sense of disappointment that many of the things that you and many of us would have wished to have moved forward, to have progressed, have not quite done so. Uh, what is the light you think that one can shed on why this should be so? Why have we not progressed closer to some of our aspirations and yours in particular? Yes, that's a, a question that's haunted me uh, for quite a long time, especially uh, in the aftermath of uh, the principal colonial wars and uh, particularly uh, the Vietnam War in my case, uh, I had the idea that I was swimming with the tide of history, that uh, European colonialism was collapsing all over the world, and that uh, uh, civil rights were advancing, and there was a kind of uh, humane uh, prospect that I felt was historically being driven by a more enlightened uh, generation of leaders and the memories of the war and the fears of nuclear war, all of those things gave me a, a sense uh, that progress was in that, um, uh, in a phase that would lead to better things. But instead, as you point out, uh, disappointment arose in many sectors, domestically in the United States, internationally, in the Middle East in particular with my concern about Palestine. Uh, and my fundamental structural insight has to do with two provocative things. One is I think the West lost a lot by winning the Cold War. And it, by winning the Cold War, it lost the important otherness of socialism. And it drove capitalism to an extreme. And that extreme, uh, resulted in inequality and massive alienation all, all over the world and led to this unexpected surge of uh, democracy. And, and I blame more the United States, the, the triumphalism after the Cold War in not engaging in self-scrutiny and in portraying a construct, uh, playing a constructive international role. It was a time to get rid of nuclear weapons, to strengthen uh, the United Nations, to uh, strengthen international law, to uh, solve the uh, tragedy of the Palestinian people, 
there were many things that could have been done, uh, but were not done. And somehow or other, the failure to respond to the outcome of the Cold War, the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union was very, uh, I think has been very detrimental. The second thing I would point to uh, is the uh, endorsement of neoliberal uh, globalization, <coughs> which created a structure that favored the efficiency of capital over the well being of people. And that produced uh, distortions in various ways all over the world. And uh, it resulted, I think, in uh, the, the kind of movements of right wing populism, uh, religious extremism, all sorts of uh, reactions to a sense that people were being excluded from uh, the uh, benefits of development and uh, make and, and attaining a better world. So I put those two things and uh, a maladjustment to the end of the Cold War and the structural consequences of neoliberal globalization as my explanatory, uh, my attempt to provide an explanatory account of uh, personal disappointment, personal political disappointment. Joe, can I jump in and, and thoroughly endorse what Richard has just said, particularly, well, first of all, with regard to the whole notion of having a conversation. I mean, the art of having a conversation that you're promoting this evening is really a lost art, because one of the consequences of, of the neoliberal order that uh, most, most people of um, my children's generation can't think of anything else. They can't think of any notion except that they are all economic commodities to be, uh, to be charged certain fees for just about everything in, in, in commercial marketplaces. And with that, neoliberalism has come an abusive use of power, wielded mostly by men, often by men in uniform or men in suits, who are largely invisible. So for me, one of the threads that comes through this is the fascination with what I would call the top-down use of power. And the other side of that coin is a massive illiteracy about what I would call life-enhancing ways of, of, of using power. Uh, you can see it in, the, in a way in, in Australia's refusal to sign the Treaty on the Pro Prohibition of uh, Nuclear Weapons, but you also see it in the pandemic of um, domestic violence. So uh, it's, and it's embedded in the so-called selfish free-for-all, totally different from what the wonderful Richard Titmus of the London School of Economics uh, in the post-war reconstruction of Britain called um, the triumph of altruism over egoism. That's a totally different set of values from those which um, Richard has just been uh, criticizing. But while I've got you there, can I... Um, um, refer you to uh, the th a theme that's running right through the, your book and uh, Richard's, in, though in a different way, and that is uh, how values, um, including the value of compassion, of course, and uh, more generally human values, ought to somehow inform policy. The, uh, my question to you is, having uh, considered so many different examples in your book, how do you think one moves from ethical appreciation of the options we have to actually action and engagement? What, how do we bridge that gap? Okay, well, two, two issues, two, two, um, two, two uh, spans to bridge, to build the bridge. 
One is that clearly there has to be a, a literacy about nonviolence in policy. We have to end the notion that cruelty, in my view, is central to policy. There has to be a different language. You can't, in, like, we can't answer your question unless we have the language to express the sort of values that uh, um, Richard was referring to earlier. The second span of the bridge is this phenomenon called courage, courage in public life. Um, you can't run politics, you can't run policies by licking your finger and putting it in the air in order to see which way the wind is blowing. You have to start, take a stand on what you believe in, what you stand for, and dear Helen Ashrawi would know this when there was a furious attempt to prevent her coming to Australia in 2003 to receive the Sydney Peace Prize. And um, I was told that we'd lose the quarter of a million dollars that we had in the Sydney Peace Foundation coffers at that time. If, uh, if we rejected Hanan, um, we could keep the cash. And I remember saying, and it was broadcast all over the place, I don't care if we only have one cent left. Uh, if, we, if we give up on this, it means we will stand for nothing. And that's hence my reference to um, a touch of courage in, in public life. Thanks very much, Stuart. Don't forget to unmute, uh, to mute, I should say. Uh, if I can just very briefly, uh, Richard, raise the question with you, which has nothing to do specifically with ethics, which you've been discussing, or values. But your book, um, even though I know uh, that you've been heavily involved uh, in various aspects of both Cold War and post-Cold War geopolitics, uh, you don't say much uh, either about Russia's resurgence uh, or about uh, China's rise. Uh, was that a conscious decision that you had so much else to talk about, there was no room for that or some other reason? Uh, in no, it was, um, well, first of all, the publisher required me to cut 100,000 words from my original manuscript. And most of what I cut had to do with my uh, more, I guess, academic uh, meditations about what was going on in the world, which was principally uh, which I was principally preoccupied with this rise of China as a transformative event and China being a different kind of rival for the West than the Soviet Union had been. And the failure to comprehend that difference is what I'm very worried about at the present time and which uh, instead of uh, being influenced by the remarkable uh, positive side of China's uh, extraordinary development and reliance on non-military ways of enhancing their international position, uh, the West has now taken the opportunity to crystallize a new alliance that aims, I fear, at a new Cold War, uh, which may have already begun, and which strives to find an ideological justification in the other and no self-scrutiny. That, and that, that combination is one that leads to the polarization of geopolitics at the very time when we need uh, solidarity and unity to deal with the uh, tangible challenges of the Anthropocene age. We'll come back to some of this. Uh, thank you, Richard, and thank you, Stuart. We'll be coming back to you too, as well, both of you as well. But let me now uh, introduce two um, other panelists uh, who have very important and uh, valuable reflections, I'm sure, to share with us. First, I'd like to uh, invite Professor Hilary Charlesworth, 
who is Laureate Professor at Melbourne Law School, Melbourne University Law School, and Distinguished Professor in the Regulatory Institutions Network at the Australian National University. Uh, she is um, an acknowledged uh, international uh, leading scholar in, uh, in law, international law in particular, international humanitarian law, human rights law, and much else. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to ask Hilary uh, to share some of her reflections uh, on having read uh, what is before us. Hilary? Thanks very much, Joe. Thanks for including me in this wonderful panel. And I begin like you by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose lands I live and work. And I acknowledge those lands were never ceded. Well, it, it's a great privilege. So I've got both of the books there in case part of the audience haven't seen the books, the book covers, which were intriguing themselves. But it's really been a fantastic privilege to have the chance to read those books together. And of course, to talk about them in the presence of their authors, these two very significant scholars of conflict and peace. Uh, both men were born in the 1930s and their experiences over these long lives infuse their accounts of where we are today. So I thought immediately that was really valuable because they have, unlike people perhaps of my generation, as old as I am, uh, quite different experiences of conflict and peace. So I think the two books are, are very nice to read together. They run on parallel tracks, but are quite different, at least at first sight. Richard's is a personal and intellectual biography sometimes disarmingly frank about people and situations he's encountered. And it's full of wonderful stories. Um, there are many, but one of the ones I particularly enjoyed was his account of supervising Robert Muller, the famous uh, uh, prosecutor, uh, his undergraduate thesis at Princeton. And I was intrigued to learn from Richard's book that the um, senior thesis was on a famous international court of justice case on whether Ethiopia and Liberia had standing to challenge the lawfulness of South Africa's imposition of apartheid in what was then known as Southwest Africa, modern day Namibia. Um, and then Stewart's on the other hand, sets out to make more general arguments about the state of our world without giving much away of his own life or journey. But what's really striking about uh, Stuart's book is he uses poetry throughout his book. And I love being introduced to some familiar poems and some completely new ones, which brings uh, almost a lyrical and personal edge to his otherwise quite daunting account of where we are now. But in the five minutes I've been given, and I've used up some of them already, I want to uh, think about the role of hope in both the books which is central to the project of uh, the topic of this evening, Imagining a Better World. So both authors in their books refer to the power of hope. Richard writes that while recognising the dire situation we're in, in terms of climate change, global uh, migration and autocratic governance, the increasing autocratic governance in our world, just to name a few, he says near the end of his book, he'd like to die with hope on his lips. Those are his words. He tells us that this comes not from his rational side, but from a spiritual side that has faith in transnational movements that are dedicated to transformational projects. So uh, I was interested in how Richard fitted in international law. That's my field. Uh, he's very critical of the international legal system and its institutions for too easily losing sight of justice as a goal and being sidetracked by power politics. Now for his part, Stuart finds hope of achieving humane governance in, among other things, the better functioning of international institutions such as the United Nations and in doctrines such as the responsibility to protect. Well, hope as the Canadian scholar Karen Mickelson has pointed out is quite distinct from optimism and faith. Hope requires solidarity and a program for action, while optimism may be a quirk of personality. It could be more passive. However, we should remember that hope has many forms and scholars of hope, and there is a whole body of hope studies, have distinguished between private and individual hopes on the one hand and those held by groups on the other. 
And uh, a further distinction has been drawn by scholars such as my ANU colleague, Peter Drahosh, in relation to group hopes, um, saying, well, we should understand there's a difference between what he calls collective hope on the one hand and public hope on the other. So collective hope means that the emotion is widely experienced in a society, that the beliefs on which the hope is based are broadly shared, and that the emotions and beliefs are expressed culturally. Whereas by contrast, public hope tends to be articulated by political leaders in a strategic way. And Peter Drahosh in his study of hope points to the, an example of public hope, uh, the way that this was used in trade negotiations between the United States and the developing world on intellectual property rights over antiretroviral drugs. So that type of hope, public hope, can dull public consciousness about injustice and delay or thwart calls for change. So I take the challenge posed by both these wonderful books, uh, which is to shore up collective hope. And I, I want to conclude by suggesting that this can be done, in my view, only by starting small rather than taking an all or nothing approach to the international legal order. In other words, and both books do this, I should say, by identifying events where international law or institutions have made a difference and building on that, or by studying local translations of international law, or what the late wonderful legal anthropologist Sally Ingle Mary called the nacularization of international legal norms, how have they been translated locally? So here in my part of the world in our region, I'm thinking it's an example of the nacularization of grounding these international norms locally, some of the impact of the international legal right to self-determination in Timor-Leste and Bougainville, for example, seems to me by examining the way that they've been translated and worked there, that can be one way towards sustaining collective hope. The, the question I have for both of the authors are, is what role do they see the international feminist movement as having uh, in achieving collective hope? Thanks, Joe, over to you. Thank you, Hilary. And I'm glad you ended on that note because of course you're well known for bringing uh, a fascinating feminist perspective to the study and practice of international law. Uh, now, let me turn to uh, Dr. Uh, Punam Yadav, uh, who has also agreed to uh, share some thoughts on um, uh, the, uh, the books that we are looking at. Professor, <clears throat> uh, Professor, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Punam Yadav uh, is, of course, um, uh, someone who's also very keenly interested in the question of gender, justice, peace, and security. She's the lecturer in humanitarian studies and co-director of the uh, IRDR Center for Gender and Disaster at uh, the University College London. So over to you, Yadav. Thank you so much, um, Professor Emily, for the introduction, and I'm really honored to have the opportunity to, to share some thoughts about these two wonderful books. So uh, first of all, I would like to um, congratulate both of the authors for these wonderful books, which offer many insights for imagining a better world. I was fascinated by how beautifully Richard has written his memoir. It was wonderful to have the opportunity to learn about your personal life. While reading your book, Richard, I can't tell you how much I wished to learn about your mother's experiences, the gaps in which, um, the gaps in the way she imagined her world to be and the social expectations and performance of her, of her motherhood. I found two common threads in these books. Both books very eloquently illustrate how personal is political, which speaks very much to the feminist vision of the world. And both books provide alternative reason for imagining a better world. In doing so, these books then also extend the discussion to personal is not only political, but also international. Again, speaking very much along the lines of feminist philosophy. 
Due to the time limitation, I have five minutes to comment on the book. So I won't go into the details of Richard's book as Professor Salsworth has already enlightened us with key insights from the book. I'd like to share some thoughts on Stuart's book, Cruelty or Humanity. First of all, I'd like to say how much I enjoyed reading your book, Stuart. You offer a new um, theory of cruelty, which is comprehensive and offers insights into both what happens in the personal sphere as well as in public sphere. As you said in the book, the accounts of cruelties are difficult to ignore, yet it is made invisible because of the way the narratives around cruelties are constructed. In public memory or in our everyday life, cruelty is often understood as a direct physical violence inflicted on human or animals, such as um, often, uh, that often means killing or torture. It is often time bound. The current understanding of cruelty also ignores the continuum, which means neither um, structural inequalities are considered nor the long-term consequences of policies and interventions. Stuart in his book argues that how cruelties are inflicted on us intentionally or unintentionally, consciously or unconsciously through policies and interventions from the very local to the international levels. He argues that cruelty is not a one-off event or an impact of one policy. It's a process. It's an outcome of a continuum of suppression and oppression. Stuart brings various examples to illustrate the way society views women, how society views the women is reflected in the national policies and practices. For instance, discriminatory citizen provis citizenship provisions for women in Nepal is linked to their secondary status in the family. Likewise, we can look at the abortion laws around the world. The strict abortion laws are linked to the dominant socioeconomic uh, socio-cultural practices of that country. Stuart argues that experiences of inequality is not a cruelty in itself. It is the persistent experience of socioeconomic and other status bound inequalities which create vulnerability to cruelty. To illustrate this, I'd like to give an example again from Nepal. Women generally have a secondary status in the society. As a result, they experience various forms of inequalities, hence the practice such as widowhood exist where they are discriminated against based on their marital status. Stuart speaks um, to feminist philosophy again when he um, argues that how even a violence is justified through policies, for instance, immigration policy and policies that promote ultra-nationalist sentiments, surgical strikes, gender-based violence, and so on. So I'd like to end uh, my comment by posing two questions to both the authors, uh, and I'd like to request them to respond if there is a time. And the first question is, the United Nations in its current form is certainly not meeting people's expectations. Do we need the UN? I'm asking this question in relation to the denial, skepticism, and sifting blame which you have raised in your book. If you think we still need the UN, then is this the time? to restructure the whole human system, to make it more effective. How can we do that? I was also wondering if you could say your thoughts on the relationship between capitalism and the prevention or the management of the current pandemic around the world. Thank you and congratulations once again to both of you. Thank you very much, Punam. And we'll be coming back to some of your questions later on in the discussion. Uh, let me now explain to everyone uh, that uh, I've taken it upon myself, <laughs> oh, I hope with everyone's um, uh, approval, uh, to focus uh, most of our remaining discussion on three broad areas, including uh, some of those that you've just raised, Punam. The first one is the inescapable issue of our time, which is Palestine and, of course, the wider Middle East. So we'll come to that in a second. Then we're going to deal with the whole question of human rights and the role of international law. And then that should take us to a discussion of institutions, and <clears throat> our leading national and international institutions today, and whether they are fit for purpose. OK, Palestine. <clears throat> It's fair to say, is it not, 
uh, that uh, for far too long, uh, but uh, unfortunately, still now, Palestine has been at the center of uh, a terrible conflict. Uh, and uh, it is um, as if there was no end uh, to the suffering. It's headline news and the latest outbreak of hostilities has left the occupied territories as we know, and Gaza in particular, in an even more frightful state than before. The conflict as I see it is a powder keg. Who better to turn to uh, than Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, distinguished Palestinian leader, legislator, activist, and scholar, a key figure in the Palestinian leadership, she served as official spokesperson of the Palestinian delegation to the Middle East peace process and has remained ever, ever since in the forefront of uh, Palestinian politics and uh, the Palestinian people's aspirations. So if I may turn to you then, Dr. Ashrawi, we see that there seems to be no end to the suffering of the Palestinian people, no end in sight to the search for a just peace. So what is your analysis of the current state of play and where to the future? We we'll ask all this because both our authors that, whose books we're looking at have made the question of Palestine a very central part of their respective books, but we'd love to hear from you uh, if if I, if I may ask you, please. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity to share with such distinguished and meaningful people in this extremely informative and challenging discussion. I would say uh, for a long time, Palestine has been the victim of several myths, beginning with the myth of, of uh, a land without a people for a people without a land, which is the most drastic denial of the existence of a whole people with their culture, their history, their identity, and their rights, as if our land was totally open and free of people and that the international community had the right to create the state of Israel on Palestinian land while simultaneously the Zionist movement denying the very existence of the Palestinians, rendering us invisible, our narrative is silenced, our, our history is denied, and uh, at the same time siding with the grave historical injustice that was done to the Palestinian people. This is uh, the beginning. We were victims of a do dominant narrative, of, uh, which was Israeli primarily, and of course with Western collusion, definitely. Uh, and when the victim is invisible, the horror of the act, the cruelty becomes admissible or normalized or acceptable. Uh, and uh, therefore, as, as Stuart, I think, quoted uh, Bertolt Brecht in saying, uh, when evil doing comes like falling rain, this is the normalization of oppression. And then it becomes, again, the current uh, version of reality. And therefore, if you don't see the victims, if you don't hear the victims, you have no responsibility and you do not bear uh, uh, the, the full weight of the crime done against them. So, uh, uh, again, it takes when, uh, a great deal of courage and integrity. Yes, as, as uh, Stuart said, and of course, as exemplified in uh, the, the life and works of Richard, to stand up to this willful and deliberate distortion and denial, and to come up and say there's a truth, there's a, a reality that has to be seen and heard, not just in terms of responsibility towards the victim, that the victim deserves to be seen and deserves to be heard, but also in terms of responsibility to humanity's right to gain access to the truth. And this whole uh, uh, construct of, of distortion and so on has been challenged. And right now, and it's gradually gaining weight. I mean, there are two factors. You have the Palestinian people's determination, resilience, refusal to lie down and die quietly, refusal to succumb to injustice, refusal to disappear for the convenience of others uh, or, or to leave their land and abandon their rights. And on the other hand, you do have these, I don't want to say only Stuart and Richard, but you do have a, 
a whole collective, a whole body of literature of people who have dared to challenge misconceptions and lies, who have dared to deal with the truth and who have dared not just to relay uh, facts, but to become actively involved. As, as uh, Richard said, I think uh, that it's not enough to talk about it. You have to experience it. You have to be there to witness it, to see it firsthand, no matter how much you write. And it takes also courage to see it and to witness it. So when you combine these two, and uh, you have those who are willing to face and to struggle and to pay the price and, uh, on the ground, and you have those who are willing to frame the, the struggle and to frame reality in terms of our common humanity and, and uh, uh, perceptions, then you are beginning to change the dominant paradigm of you know, uh, accepting the asymmetry of power, accepting uh, the fact that there are people who have to be blamed for their suffering, for their victimization. And there are uh, another set of people who are treated as being above the law, as having dispensation to do what they want with preferential treatment and exceptionalism. So challenging this is not easy because you pay a personal price, not just in terms of the funding of, of the Sydney Peace Prize, but in terms of smear campaigns, like the ones that we face all the time, where your own integrity, your own person is made subject to attack and, and to uh, distortion. Uh, however, the, having done that, it seems to me, and with this, uh, uh, combination, including some of the early Israeli writers. Uh, uh, when when uh, Ilan Pape wrote uh, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, people were shocked, were horrified that he would lay bare, he would really uh, dismantle the whole concept of uh, uh, displacement and replacement and how Palestine had to be denied and displaced and removed from people's consciousness and even from history and to superimpose another people, another identity, another nation on Palestine. So these uh, have gained momentum together. And with the uh, publishing of these two books, it became uh, very clear that uh, the courage to speak out and the courage to act are necessary uh, uh, twins, so to speak. And uh, uh, well, many Palestinians keep asking, we are born into this. We are born with a challenge, with a responsibility, with a historical burden. We are generally, you know, uh, detained, beaten up, shot at, maligned, uh, uh, imprisoned, and so on, houses demolished. This is something we are born into. We didn't choose to be victims. What makes these uh, uh, public intellectuals, these two humanists and others like them, take the necessary step to say, I stand in solidarity, to say I'm moving from abstraction and intellectualism to uh, active engagement and involvement. And this is a very serious question, but at the same time, it uh, empowers the Palestinians, it empowers the victim, and it challenges the constructs and systems of power that have sought a monopoly uh, generally on the discourse, whether on women's issues or whether on issues of justice and rights and, and, and so on, or whether on issues of eradication of a whole people and the nation. And having uh, uh, decided to challenge the complacency and the comfort of, of processed language and uh, discourse, uh, and having decided to undertake this, <laughs> they have now reached a stage where I think they normalized the examination of reality. They have normalized challenging of myths. It's not just the people without a land for a land, a land without a people and so on, but the myth of the most moral army in the world in Israel when it is seen as beating up children, as killing people deliberately, demolishing homes, stealing land and so on. Uh, it has also demolished the myth of the only democracy in the Middle East, that it can do no wrong. And it has, uh, again, uh, given context to the Palestinian uh, uh, question or issue. And I think there were three issues that are important. When you deconstruct 
at least uh, perceptually, structures and systems of power, uh, you are beginning an incremental process because you have to replace them with something. And knowledge is the most difficult thing to replace uh, uh, these uh, constructs. But patiently, stubbornly, we, we together have been chipping away at the wall of apartheid, of subjugation and devaluation of Palestinian lives and rights. And both Stuart and Richard saw this from the beginning. Uh, and therefore, when you are early <laughs> in terms of, of uh, choosing your own battlegrounds, it means that you have identified what is meaningful in terms of uh, struggling against injustice. But you've also... Uh, Dr. Aswa, we, we may need to uh, move on a little bit. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry to be pushing, but please... Uh, can you, can you contextualizing support? Palestine, I'll say very quickly, within a recognized and acknowledged human condition uh, based on justice, simply you have this asymmetry of power, oppressor and oppressed, occupied and occupied. So you cannot sit down and say both are equal in terms of objective conditions and both share equal responsibility because the victim is always blamed, but we can talk about this later. But when you start with the moral imperative of the validation through recognition, truth and empathy, of the victim, then you are engaging in empowering the victim. And this ethics of, of inclusion, <laughs> to me, it's, it's crucial as a woman, as a Palestinian, as somebody who all my life I've been struggling against not just exclusion, but against stereotyping and, and uh, so on. This, you require a combination of indignation and altruism, of courage and naivete, perhaps because the enormity of the price you're paying is not always evident, or of obstinacy, stubbornness, and creativity at the same time. And both your books have that. So the, the emergent discourse now is based on facts and truth. This latest uh, assault, total assault on Palestine, whether the, the bombing of Gaza and the killing of hundreds or thousands before, the, the horrific siege, the ethnic cleansing of Jerusalem, and the uh, triple siege of Jerusalem, the siege and fragmentation of the West Bank and the land theft and the war crimes of settlements and so on, as well as the uh, system of uh, uh, structural and, and persistent discrimination against Palestinians of 48. All these things have come to a head now. It's a situation that is, yes, extremely volatile, but it's a situation of tremendous promise and change. We can talk about this later a unity of the Palestinians together with a unity of this very invigorating uh, uh, solidarity movement, a network of, of solidarity that have come out and expressed openly in demonstrations all over the world, 150,000 in London, I don't know how many in, in Washington, in New York, in, in uh, uh, Texas. In, in Dr. Strawi, we have to move on, I'm so sorry. Okay, no problem. So I'm saying we are in a, in a turning point. Let's put it that way, and we can discuss this later. And we yeah. have both Stuart and Richard to thank, partially, not entirely, but they have uh, created this uh, collective of uh, uh, humanistic thought. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, of course, we've been talking about Palestine, uh, but... Uh, both books deal with the Middle East more widely, as well as Palestine, uh, and uh, with good reason. Uh, if you look at the map uh, from uh, Iraq, Iran, Syria, and of course, um, the Arab Spring that has yet to live up to its aspirations. If you look at the turn towards authoritarianism, uh, to continuing conflicts, both internal and external, uh, the Middle East seems a very unsettled place. So if I may turn now to um, uh, Professor Amin Saikal, whom I've known, of course, for a very long time. Professor Saikal <clears throat> was, was a distinguished professor in political science at the ANU, Australian National University, founding director of the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies for 25 years, 
uh, an internationally acknowledged uh, authority on uh, Iran, Afghanistan, and other parts of the Middle East on which is written widely. So if I can put this question to you, uh, I mean, right across the region, within and between countries, there seems to be turbulence and suffering unlimited. Why is it so? Why does the Middle East so dominate international relations and politics, and often not in a very positive way, for the people in the region? How do you assess, in relation to this, the role of external powers? I mean, Thanks very much, Joe. And uh, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, both uh, Richard and Stuart on the two books that they've written, and uh, which I have uh, enjoyed very much uh, reading uh, both of them. And of course, one message uh, that I take from both books is that uh, uh, one has to have really the courage to stand up to injustices, to cruelty, and uh, a, 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 indeed a, a, a immoral and unethical practices, which should uh, really become quite really common in uh, across uh, the Middle East and why the Middle East has become so turbulent in a sort of a perpetual state of uh, turbulence. Uh, there are a large number of factors and uh, I, I don't want to really dwell very much on history, you know, apart from, uh, uh, you know, colonial and new imperialist impacts on the Middle East. Uh, there are a number of other factors which often have not been highlighted, and uh, I think it is important that we pay more attention to them. Uh, that one of the, one of the things which has concerned me over the years is uh, how uh, politics uh, continuously becomes personalized as against institutionalized in the Middle East. It is really the role of personalities uh, which uh, uh, provide for either continuity or discontinuity or uh, uh, stability or instability uh, in the region. Political institutions rise and fall uh, with uh, personalities uh, and, and evolve around personalities. Uh, and uh, of course, some people would like to really attribute this to um, uh, uh, historical existence of uh, authoritarian rule. And, to, and, and some scholars have tried to relate it, for example, to the religion of Islam, that is a monolithic religion, and therefore what has spawned in the course of history is uh, uh, B b basically an authoritarian rule. But that's not really true because Islam is uh, from uh, its early existence has been pluralist from within and pluralist from outside. I mean, it, uh, Islam has been imposed on various cultures and grafted onto culture, uh, different cultures. And, uh, and it has adopted a dialectic approach uh, in its uh, interaction with those cultures. Uh, the, uh, it, it is uh, uh, Islamized certain aspects of those cultures and at the same time also has been influenced by the, some aspects of those, uh, uh, those cultures. Uh, so, so I don't think that uh, you, you know, bringing Islam into it would really get, get us very far in terms of explaining that why the Middle East is so uh, uh, volatile. I think that uh, uh, the, the, the other important point is that uh, uh, no, attempt has really been made right across the region. And uh, that includes the rhetoric which comes out of Iran, particularly from the uh, religious establishment, uh, that um, uh, leaders uh, have devoted uh, much of their time or energy in terms of bringing about the structural reforms. Uh, the, everything that has been really done right across, not from Iran, across the Arab, uh, uh, Arab uh, Middle East, um, it has been very, very superficial. It has been more self-centered. It is more in terms of uh, 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 political and pecuniary gains of the day, uh, rather than actually immersing themselves into their societies and to try to bring about the kind of structural changes which are absolutely necessary to provide the, the uh, firm foundations for uh, uh, long-term stability and long-term long security of the citizens, and more importantly, empowering 
the citizens uh, to uh, be able to determine their own lives and the destiny of their nations. I mean, at the moment, one of the things which is very disturbing, uh, again, throughout the region is the, uh, the, the entrenchment of uh, autocratic authoritarian rule. And I think, uh, uh, if I could refer to one of Richard's uh, uh, terms that he uh, talks about sometimes, or has talked in the past about concealed authoritarianism, that's true. I mean, you know, they, of course, they do have parliaments and they do uh, have elections and so on, but it is basically for a benefit of the elites, by the benefit of the families, but rather than for a benefit of the public. I think until the, this situation prevails in terms of really public not playing an active role uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the running of their societies, I think the Middle East is going to remain vulnerable uh, because of the lack of necessary in, uh, internal uh, conditions and uh, internal foundations is going to remain vulnerable to outside interventions. And that's why that, and, and then of course, uh, outside interventions, whether it's from the United States or the Soviet Union, or the, in the past Soviet Union or Russia today, and of, of course, Chinese has also made an inroad into uh, the um, Middle East uh, lately. Uh, the, uh, they, 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 they are able to exploit the domestic vulnerabilities and they uh, and their exploitation in turn um, make those societies even weaker and dependent on the outside and therefore incapable of bringing about the kind of structural reforms which are absolutely necessary in order to uh, 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 establish uh, the necessary basis for a long-term stability and continuity. Let me just stop there. Um, we're running a little bit beyond uh, our timelines, uh, but I just wanted to uh, ask uh, Richard, uh, you of course have a particular interest uh, in how the US has conducted itself at the official level uh, in the Middle East. Uh, would you like to just share a quick thought on that aspect of the equation in the Middle East? Uh, well, I would um, affirm what Hanan had to say about this being a moment when we can take a certain measure of hope about the future, including in the United States. There were, uh, for the first time during a period of uh, violence of Israel, principally directed at Gaza, but also, as she suggests, at uh, Jerusalem itself and, to and toward the people under living under occupation. Uh, there were something like 500 cities and towns that had pro-Palestinian demonstrations during this military operation of Israel. That never happened before. There were important people in both halves of Congress that spoke out against what was happening and questioned the uh, continuation of military assistance to Israel. The idea of bipartisanship in not questioning what uh, Israel does may be collapsing and if it does, it will create a lot more political space for a geopolitical shift that may have great consequences that are hard to predict. And one point, the, we notice that uh, the new American Secretary of State, Blinken, constantly speaks in his anti-Chinese mode of a rules-governed uh, international relations that the U.S. practices, but our rivals do not. If there is any country that fails to uh, adhere to a rules-governed uh, international order, it is the United States. And it's an embarrassing failure of self-scrutiny. American leaders more, need more than anything else a mirror to gaze at themselves 
and maybe then they would begin to act more compatibly with the kind of humanist vision that Stuart articulates so well. And I should just say that uh, in addition to my admiration for his book, I had the pleasure of writing the foreword to the book. So we have an organic connection uh, that uh, pleases me and uh, I think uh, unites our two uh, struggles for justice and humanity. No, I just, I just jump in quickly. I just, I just wanted to reflect comments that are coming for a large number of members of the audience to the effect that it's almost impossible to distinguish Israel from the United States. That talking about the 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 fascination with brute force to deal with every problem, it's almost as though the gun culture of the United States is ex is is exported. Uh, in particular to Israel and vice versa. Uh, thanks very much, both Richard and Stuart. Now, um, it'd be good, of course, to continue. This is a huge subject. Palestine, the Middle East, we've hardly mentioned Iraq. Iran's got a bit of a mention, so, but, but I'm afraid Tom will defeat us if um, we allow the, this, this particular aspect of the discussion at the expense of some others. So I want to turn... Uh, I mentioned earlier that we were going to look at two areas. I think we might need to bring them a little bit together because they are very germane to each other. And that is the international human rights regime, in the role of international law, and side by side with that, uh, our institutions, both national and international, to what extent they can deliver uh, human rights, uh, to uh, respect for uh, the human person, to what extent they can behave, uh, they can engender notions of compassion, the relief of human suffering and so on. So uh, on that question, uh, if I may bring Hilary Childsworth into uh, the discussion. Uh, Hilary, as we all know, there's been very considerable progress uh, in terms of uh, codification of laws internationally on, let's say, human rights from the UN Charter right to the present, so many covenants and conventions and treaties. Um, but at the same time, while this progress has been going on, uh, we have seen extraordinary intensification of the abuse of human rights and human dignity. So can I put a provocative question to you? Is this a losing race at the moment? Or is, there, is it a race that has any prospect of being won on behalf of respect for human rights and human compassion uh, towards people who are currently the victims uh, of conflict and uh, terrible suffering? Thanks, Joe. Uh Look, I think that, and I, I was struck by in, in Richard's book, he recalls, I think, the topic of his, his uh, doctoral thesis at, at Harvard Law School, which was talking about the nature of international law. And I think perhaps people have uh, put a lot of faith in the international human rights system and think if it's there, uh, it should really be a very ready answer to a lot of the human rights abuses we see around the world and some of the some of the most striking ones have already been mentioned tonight but I think we have to be realistic that I think Richard made the point as he recounts in his in his thesis that just as we um, we know that we have all sorts of domestic national laws that prohibit violence in all of its forms uh, you just have to think here in Australia of the incredible, the pandemic of domestic violence in Australia. We have laws that in theory prohibit this, and yet we have one a woman killed a week here in Australia with a 25 million population. So, I mean, it's an extraordinary number of, of women killed each year in Australia. So I think we, we can't expect the legal system to answer all the problems. And, and Richard goes into this in quite a lot of detail in his book, recalling his own deep involvement with the human rights system, uh, specifically with the, with the Human Rights Council. 
at the international level, these bodies are intensely political because the office holders in most of the international human rights system are states that have a variety of uh, uh, commitments that aren't always a pure ideal of human rights. But, but so while acknowledging that it's, it's, it's not going to be a perfect response to this, as I, I said in my, my earlier comments, I think we have to look at the times when it, when it has been useful. And uh, I think that uh, the human rights system has been valuable. It, it won't be, it will often be nudging or pushing countries or perhaps shaming them or bringing light to bear on particular issues and just keeping up pressure in that way. But if we look at Australia ourselves, we are often criticised, say, in the Human Rights Council during the Universal Periodic Review, two main topics always come up. One is the situation of Australia's Indigenous people. And secondly, it's Australia's treatment of asylum seekers. And these, these are roundly criticised, but it doesn't seem to really provide a very strong form of pressure uh, on Australia. So uh, I think we have to be modest in our expectations. To me, it's still very valuable to have the standards there, but uh, we, and perhaps their most useful form is when those international standards are brought home and made real in national legal systems. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Hilary. I'd now like to bring into the discussion someone who hasn't yet spoken, and that is Dr. Chandra Muzaffa, one of Asia's uh, leading public intellectuals. He's the president of JUST, uh, the International Movement for the Just for a Just World, author of many, many books, and uh, a frequent uh, speaker and commentator on issues of justice, human rights, responsibilities, and much else. So, Chandra, if I can ask you, uh, I think in your case, you have often spoken of the importance of the dignity of the human person and how that notion is central to many uh, ethical uh, and indeed religious uh, belief systems. Uh, how do you think we're traveling in terms of elevating the dignity of the human person at the center of our politics nationally and internationally? And how do you assess the role of religion? Uh, is it part of the problem or part of the solution? Chandra? Thank you, Joe. Let me begin by congratulating both Richard and Stuart for their books. I'm more familiar with Richard's writings and also know Richard much better over the years, a long relationship, a long friendship. But I've also been exposed to Stuart's writings and had the pleasure of um, participating in the seminar at his university many years ago. Now, your question about religion and its role well, religion itself is very complex. And I think it is better to deconstruct religion when we talk about religion in relation to human rights, the quest for human dignity and so on. There's one aspect of religion which is concerned about human dignity and that you would find right across the different faiths. But there are also other aspects of religion which dominate the thinking of people who are religious. And this would include the forms, the symbols, the institutions, and um, the histories, practices which have evolved over a long period of time. All these things are very, very important in defining religion. I do not think it is possible to take these things apart when we talk about the impact of religion as such. What we have witnessed, I think, is um, a resurgence in terms of religious consciousness amongst perhaps all faiths. And it's happening for a variety of reasons. These reasons are sometimes conditioned by the context 
sometimes by global factors at work. Now that is certainly happening. In the last uh, 30 years, I think it has become very evident, religious resurgence. At the same time, religious resurgence is impacting upon other aspects of life. It's not just human rights or human dignity, it's impacting upon the economy, it's impacting upon national politics, international relations, and so on. And this is something that we should expect to happen. What is not helpful, I think, is, and here I'm sort of alluding to a point which Richard makes a number of times in his memoirs, what is not helpful is an attitude that is dismissive of religion. When they look at this phenomenon, this, this is something that should go away. It's primitive, it's um, the other word that's used in times, it's just primordial, it shouldn't concern us, it's not part of what we want and all the rest of it. It doesn't help at all. We adopt that sort of attitude because you're not attempting to understand the phenomenon that confronts us. And the other attitude, which I think is also not helpful, is people who have this very uh, naive and simplistic notion of religion, that it is the panacea for all our ills. It's going to solve all our problems. It's just a question of becoming more religious and everything will be taken care of. In some societies, for instance, where there is a crisis in education, they say the answer is to introduce more religion into the school curriculum. Now, these are very simplistic approaches. And uh, Richard consistently has adopted a balanced approach. It is a reality that we have to deal with. It has played a very big role in shaping the human consciousness. It will continue to be important in the future. You cannot sort of uh, sideline religion in that sense. And religion in all its complexity will continue to be important. But I think what we have to do is to try to engage with religion as a phenomenon and those who advocate religion. And also, I suppose those who dismiss religion would continue to engage with these people. It's that sort of engagement and dialogue that we really need at this point in time. And from what I can see, Joe, in terms of the impact of religion today, you have to look at the context. Different societies, it's different sort of impact. You know, Indonesia, which is uh, your neighbor and our neighbor, Malaysia's neighbor, is a very interesting case study when it comes to the impact of religion. It is the world's um, largest Muslim country. It is the fourth biggest country in the world in terms of its population. It is also a very diverse society. Many people are not aware of this, that Indonesia has 7,000 different ethnic groups and it has got most of the major religions of the world. They're all in Indonesia. And um, it's, it's an amazing uh, society. And yet, if you look at uh, the general tone and tenor of religion in the public sphere in Indonesia, it's been quite remarkable. No exclusive, fanatical religious political party, and I emphasize this political party, has been able to hold the sway in Indonesia right through all these years, different types of political systems and so on, but there's never been a fanatical religious party that's able to dominate Indonesian politics. The parties that have emerged, and some of them have uh, religion as part of their agenda, they've been generally very inclusive. They have always sought to give importance to a national ideology called the Pancasila, it's five principles, and this national ideology is very inclusive and universal. It is just amazing if you look at uh, what that ideology says. It's part of the Indonesian constitution. It's its preamble. And that is Indonesia. It is a very accommodative society. Yet there are fringes and there are elements which uh, create quite a bit of uneasiness amongst Indonesians and people in Malaysia and other parts of the world. But nonetheless, I would maintain, as I've always maintained, that Indonesia is an outstanding example of multi-religious understanding and accommodation. It is not highlighted. 
especially when there's so much talk about Islam and the public sphere about Islam in different parts of the world. Why is it that Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, is not highlighted as an example of inclusiveness, of accommodation, of uh, this, this amazing ability to combine elements from so many different cultures as part of its religious milieu. Now, so this is a point, Joe, that one has to keep in mind. And I think it is also important for our friends in Australia, New Zealand, and other places to understand this about what is really happening. In other words, the point I want to make, and you know, since uh, there are others who want to express their views, the point I want to make is you know, that the discourse on religion at the global level is very often conditioned by international politics. In other words, if you go back to what I just talked about, you'll seldom get anything positive about Islam in the mainstream media. Even if it's happening just uh, under your nose, it will not be highlighted. It's always the most negative elements that are highlighted. I mean, you take yet another case study, if you like, and look at uh, Palestine from what one has read about Palestine. I think it is a remarkable nation, and I would deliberately use that term, in terms of uh, its ability to bring people together. In some ways, Christian Muslim solidarity in Palestine is uh, out of the ordinary. And it's something that stretches from things that are very mundane to th things which are very profound. And that's Palestine, and that is uh, the reality as far as uh, Palestine is concerned. I've been talking about this, uh, Richard and Joe, you know, about my involvement on the Palestinian issue. And the reason why I've highlighted this is in a country like Malaysia, which is a multi-religious society, also very multi-religious, we want to emphasize this all the that the Palestinian struggle is not linked to a particular religious community. It is multi-religious, that it's just amazing how Christians and, and Jews have also been part of this struggle and the tremendous contribution of the Christians to the Palestinian struggle, which I think Muslims in countries like Malaysia should be made aware of, just as we would like uh, minorities, Christian, Hindus, Buddhists, and others to be told that the Palestinian struggle also embraces people of other faiths. It's examples of this sort, real concrete examples that convince people that human beings, whatever our religious or ethnic affiliations, we are capable of transcending those boundaries and barriers and building bonds that are indestructible. And these bonds count because these are bonds which are forged in the crucible of strength. That's what I think Palestinians show in the world. Thank you, Chandra. Uh, I should uh, explain uh, to uh, our diverse audience that in posing the questions I have been, as I've been doing, I've been taking into account some of the comments uh, and questions that people have been raising. Uh, but of course, I can't do justice to all the comments, let alone all the questions. But some uh, we have already been discussing. Uh, if I can just finish off for the next five minutes before I ask everyone to share a concluding reflection or thought. Um, OK, we've put certain things on the map, so to speak, in this discussion. Uh, we have, on the one hand, uh, institutions, national institutions, international institutions. Uh, we have civil society and the various movements, collective projects, uh, initiatives of all kinds. As we look even just at those three, even for a moment, uh, perhaps putting to one side the role of the market and the powerful interests uh, that uh, uh, tend to shape the market internationally and nationally, uh, not because it's not important, but just for a moment, do you see, and this is open to anyone, to pitch in if they would wish, uh, do you see the current balance between national institutions and international institutions on the one hand, heavily weighted at the moment in favor of the state, the national state, uh, 
and between institutions generally and civil society. Do you see this balance shifting in years to come, hopefully not too distantly in the future, in ways that are more promising, more open to the principles, the ethics, the values that have been spoken about and which feature in both books. Would anyone like to offer a comment around that question? Joe, Joe I, I, I have a sense of urgency about your, the answer to your, uh, a response to your question. Um, partly because we're trying to imagine a better world. And I want to quickly go back to what to an appeal really by Hillary and Punam about the feminist movement and the, and, the, and the dreadful plight of women around the world and the abusive use of power disproportionately by men. And we can see it, for example, in, in West Papua, just up the road, which is in which the Indonesians are at this moment slaughtering uh, the people of West Papua. And so, so if there's a different way of thinking about the exercise of power, it would transcend all these distinctions between institutions. If there was greater equality, greater fascination with nonviolence, then we'll, we'll get round to uh, identifying the steps we need to take urgently to uh, imagine a, better, a, a totally different way of living. And in a way, you can't separate the issue about capitalism and the desperate need to erode the worst effects of capitalism from uh, ways to answer your question. Anyone else? Yes, I have my hand raised. Please. This is Hanan, thank yes, you. Please. Yes, I, I, I would like, I agree with Stuart, of course, but I want to go back to the issue of uh, multilateralism and all these institutions that were set up after the Second World War because I think they were set up post hoc after the fact, trying to rectify and deal with the, the consequences and the horrors of uh, what happened in the West primarily, not all over the world in terms of setting up what is called a rules-based system or a human rights uh, a charter and, and so on. Uh, I think the, the UN right now, the multilateral system faces several challenges. One is the legacy of the, the Second World War and the fact that it reflects the power system, particularly in its uh, Security Council and in the veto right of several countries and so on. This has been brought into question repeatedly and it has not been uh, responded to very nicely to the dependence of this multilateral system on powerful states and on the funding from powerful states. We've been blackmailed repeatedly by being told you can't go to the ICC or whatever organization you join. Uh, we will defund the Americans actually blackmailed institutions, including the ICC. They left the UNESCO, they left the Human Rights Council. They had a, a whole campaign against Richard Us. But they are subject to the power politics and the dominant powers of, of the world and the funding. And three, the third thing which I think is important is the lack of ability uh, for enforcement uh, beyond military and engagement according to chapter seven, but real enforcement is missing uh, in many ways. And that has to be worked out. I think we need a global conversation among several other weaknesses, a global conversation on how the two systems of accountability and protection can be uh, uh, translated into an active agenda and, and the means of intervention. And how do you, as you said, just how do you find the balance between this tight control of a nation state of sovereignty huh? uh, and viewing sovereignty as a license to oppress your own people? And of course, <clears throat> the issue of humanity and humanism and the prevalence of uh, a rights system that should apply to all. Thank you, uh, Hanan. Sure, Anyone pitching? Yes, uh, Amin. Uh, yes, uh, Richard wrote a book uh, called "Endangered Planet" in 1972, if I uh, recall correctly, and in that he would argue uh, argued for a reformation of the United Nations uh, uh, into a global governance. I, I'm just wondering if Richard is still think that is a valid. Uh, proposal to put forward. Uh, let me, uh, I was going to say something along that line uh, anyway in response 
uh, and continuation of Hanan's uh, comment. The, the UN was set up in a contradictory way. It, on the one side, was based on state equality and international law and human rights. But on the other hand, it was based on the primacy of geopolitics. Otherwise, the veto doesn't make any sense to give the most powerful countries in the world at that time in 1945, the right to uh, avoid the obligations of the UN Charter when it was inconvenient for it was a direct co uh, contradiction. And it meant that the weaker countries were accountable to a law governed uh, system, but the stronger countries were free to uh, obey when they wished and to disobey when they wished. And you still have that tension between the primacy of geopolitics and the pretension of a law governed world. And you can work around the edges of that in, in ways that uh, Hillary suggested earlier. But until we undo that contradiction, we can't tackle the larger issues that confront humanity. And I think the sooner we recognize that uh, tension between uh, geopolitics and a counter hegemonic international legal order, uh, we will not be able to uh, protect the natural habitat, not, not be able to satisfy the ecological imperative, nor will we be able to satisfy the humanistic imperative. Thanks, Richard. Well, what I'd like now to do, and uh, I've mentioned this to all our panelists, is try and bring the discussion a little bit to a conclusion because time is moving. And that is to ask each of you, uh, first, our five panelists, and then the two authors. What is the concluding reflection you would like to share, especially around this question, but not exclusively? And that is, are we at a, the world and the countries that make it up, the nations, the civilizations, the cultures, at a remarkable moment of transition? as some have argued. And uh, that transition has many aspects. Someone has already, I think it was um, uh, Richard mentioned uh, the rise of China, uh, the possible decline of the United States and the West, in, and uh, Chandra has spoken of the, the rise of a more uh, dynamic Indonesia and perhaps other parts of East Asia. Are we moving in a major point of transition, which could be cultural, which could be political, which offers promise, a promise for future direction in a more positive way, uh, or are we a bit stuck at the moment, not knowing where to go? So uh, from all of you, a concluding reflection on what you see as possibilities of transition and some promising signs to which all of us, including everyone who's sharing in this forum, uh, might be able to engage with and make a useful contribution. So if I may ask the five panelists uh, to uh, jump in and offer a concluding reflection, and then we'll turn to um, um, uh, Richard and then Stuart. So uh, who, which of the five panelists would like to start? Could I, Joe, you know? Yes, uh, please. Start the ball rolling. There are three very quick points I'd like to make in relation to the question that you posed. Yeah. Number one, the rise of China, I think is going to be the major turning point in the coming decades because its implications which we shall not go into great detail here, but its implications will affect not only interstate relations, but also relations 
between uh, the hegemonic system that has dominated the world, basically a West-oriented hegemonic system for the last 200 odd years, and uh, the rest of the world. I think that will change forever, irreversibly, and China will play a major role in that. Number two, linked to that is the decline of the US and of the West as a whole. The US, because the West is dominant at this stage, beginning to decline very rapidly. And I do not think that is reversible. It is again a trend which is very obvious. And uh, I would like to highlight very quickly something that has seldom been highlighted as far as that trend is concerned. I think it is China's dominant role in science and technology, which is going to be the factor and the U.S.'s decline as far as science and technology is concerned. We are now seeing it in your the latest developments and so on. That's the second factor. And the third factor is something that we, all of us alluded to. And if I may very quickly make this point, the emergence of civil society. If you look at the two earlier attempts at um, establishing international institutions, the League of Nations, state-driven, United Nations state driven. I think after this, if there is a reshaping of the international order, civil society will play a very big role. We saw signs of that in 2003, the protests over Iraq. If you look at every protest after that, including the latest Palestine, the 11 day conflict there, if you like, you see the role of civil society. It expresses itself in different ways, but you cannot ignore civil society anymore. And I think civil society will play a major role in reshaping international institutions and international law in the coming decades. Thank you. Um, Fascinating. Who next? Can I do come in? Yes, please. Uh, thanks. Um, I think um, one of the things that gives me hope about uh, a better future. And that is that it's become very evident, uh, as we pointed out, that the United States power is on decline. And although, as Richard said, that, that the United States was triumphant in willing the Cold War, but it has lost two small wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And that must really gave no the American policymakers, a great deal to think about where the United States is really going. At one point, we'd been assured by the American Secretary of Defense that the United States can fight the three wars at the same time, but they have not been able to war actually fight two wars at the same time, and they have, they have definitely failed. And the other thing that I think Chandra pointed out, and it gives me again, again hope about the future, and that is that there is a struggle going on between the forces of status quo and the forces of change. And that is more evident in the Middle East and perhaps in some of the other parts of the world. I mean, those who want a reformation of their states and societies and those who want to really hang on to what it, uh, exists for their benefits. But they cannot, this is an, an unsustainable on the forces of the establishment. I think eventually that will have to really give away at, okay, how long would that take? I mean, we know that the Arab Spring came and got, has gone, and it, uh, uh, in, in many ways the Arab Spring failed. But the, what, what it really spawned in terms of a struggle between the state and society, that is still going on. We have not really seen the end of that. And that, and that is that what really makes me think that I think while we are at a critical stage and a world transition, but I think that is the direction which, uh, which is well, for me, seems more hopeful. Thank you. May Please. I? Yes. Okay. What gives me hope is something that is beyond borders, beyond nation states, because I'm looking at the younger generation. I'm looking at the young people who have access, access to facts, access to knowledge, and access to tools of communication like social media, and they can mobilize, they can link up, they can render a narrative and their own views uh, common and shared, and they can challenge the rigid power systems that we were talking about, whether in terms of 
uh, nations themselves or in, in, in terms of the uh, global system or multilateral system. So I think there is now hope that this new language, which has been in many ways enriched by uh, uh, works and, and uh, the output of the intellectual activists, I think these are able to uh, generate or formulate a language of uh, humanity, a language of rights, a language of freedom, a language of the integrity of the human being, individually or collectively, and they have made the connection. I find it extremely invigorating. In Palestine, when Mun al-Kurd and her brother were arrested, instantly, people knew of it, instantly they mobilized, instantly they, there was a major outcry and they put pressure and the Israeli government had to release them. So in a sense, this access to knowledge is also an invitation to action and the control over facts and the control over what gets to be heard and what not is no longer possible within states nowadays. And uh, I think it's very important that we acknowledge this and we seek the limit, not just the limits of sovereignty, but also the curtailing aspects of sovereignty and one last point on religion. I think when religion is weaponized, when religion is used as a, a tool uh, to claim divine right and to claim <laughs> divine dispensation and as a basis for geopolitical decisions, we are in serious trouble. But when you look at enlightened religions as a matter of individual or basic, I don't want to go into that, but still our problem has always been that when you claim monopoly on the truth and absolutist power, then certainly you are going not just against the grain, but you are really creating the basis of an insolvable or unsoluble uh, conflict. And religious wars have a way of not being uh, easily resolved. So let's stay away from this. And my last point is that gives me hope is that cruelty, when taken to an extreme, Injustice, when taken to an extreme, in many ways goes around and turns against itself. This is what happened, even though it still exists, but with Trumpism, with the Netanyahu racist extremist ideology, all these things in many ways have exposed themselves to the world because they've gone so far that nobody could be blinded by uh, uh, propaganda or by a uh, dominant narrative. And that has happened in history. You cannot be cruel forever. Somebody will call you out and from within your own closed system of victimization, there will be the exposure and the uh, counter effects uh, of your own actions. And I think we're seeing it happening now, laying bare the cruelty of the occupation and Israeli measures and practices of Trumpism, of Orban, of, of uh, Bolsonaro and so on. This club that has taken over for a while now is being seen for what it is even within their own nation states, but globally they can be countered by the new voice of humanity and the young. Thank you, uh, Anna. Um, Poonam, would you like to offer a comment, please? Sure. Um, so actually I am interested in um, a smaller question, uh, more than the bigger one, because I think the smaller questions are linked to the bigger question. I'd like to just give an example of rubbish collector in our, from our household. So during Christmas, if you go and ask the rubbish collector, they will tell you um, the story of each household in your community. So what I'm trying to say is that um, we need to look at the individuals and their sufferings. When we look at the individuals' lived experiences, then we'll be able to understand the global order and the impact of global policy. So that's one point. Second point that I'd like to raise is the question of civil society. Often we talk about civil society and we take it for granted, civil society as given, as neutral, as unbiased space. But we need to rethink, we need to rethink who the civil society um, is and are, and, and is there any reform that needs to be done even in that sector. Often NGOs are, um, are acting as civil society organizations and that have a lot of consequences. The third point I'd like to mention is that decolonizing our education, educational practices and curriculums as well. Um, who are we reading? Um, um, are we reading um, the Western scholars? Are we reading the scholars from the global south? 
And what are they offering? Do we need to rethink? Do we need to challenge? Do we need to be more critical? And I'd like to end um, by saying that um, this, is, um, this is a good time um, to start this conversation because there is an increased awareness among us as well as there is uh, the willingness um, among people to, to do something to, to make this world a, a better place. So thank you. Thank you, Poonam. Hilary, it's your turn. Thank you. I, I, I just really want to follow on from what Hanan Ashrari was saying. I think where I get my optimism as an educator is from uh, the power of education. And I think we tend, at least in Australia, to consider international norms quite separate to domestic legal norms. And I think what could be a very practical way ahead is to really look at our education system going right back to the very earliest years of education when children are very young and introducing them to the idea that there are these alternative norms beyond those just in our society. And if I can just squeeze in a question for Richard here that he can ignore or not as he wants, he, 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 he refers to what gives him hope is he refers to an emergent politics of impossibility. And if he has the time, I'd just like him to say a bit more about that. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, well, there you are. You've got the point of, of entry, um, uh, Richard, a question, and then uh, any accompanying or, or different thought that you would like to share with us. Uh, I'm not brave enough to ignore Hillary's question. Um, but let me say very briefly what I mean by an emergent politics of impossibility is that when you uh, define politics as the art of the possible, it has tended to play into the hands of political realists who uh, view political change as incremental. And if we are to live up to the challenges of transition, it means we have to indulge in the realities of non-incremental change, which has occurred in surprising ways that the realist never, never dreamed of during my lifetime, including the Soviet collapse, the collapse of apartheid in South Africa, many other examples of what seemed impossible until it happened and then so-called experts like ourselves come along and tell you why it had to happen. But so what I'm really saying is be guided by your beliefs. We don't know the future. Your beliefs and your values are what can give shape to struggle. Quick point on American decline. Beware of a superpower in decline because it has very few things other than its weapons at its disposal. So my hope in America is that internal forces like youth and women will be agents of positive uh, change in time quickly because there are big dangers. And we should remember that not only is the US not capable of fighting two wars or three wars at once, it hasn't succeeded in one war. I mean, it, it's lost the wars in Vietnam and Afghanistan, even though it enjoyed total military superiority. And we haven't learned what the, this decline of military agency in the shaping of world history the, the, all the anti-colonial wars were won by the weaker side militarily. And that underpinned my sense of hope about the Palestinian struggle because the great balancing factor is the steadfastness of the oppressed and the solidarity of global civil society. That Those forces brought the South African apartheid regime 
uh, to its knees. And uh, Palestinians, in my view, and the rest of us, could do well to study that South African transformation, which no one expected. I was in South Africa as an observer of a Namibian trial uh, in, in 68, and no one thought that change would come except through a bloody civil war. And yet it happened because of this solidarity uh, combined uh, with resistance, those two crucial elements. Let me just say a final thing. We haven't mentioned enough the importance of an ecological awakening, and which, will, which I think will provide a lot of energy for change. The example of uh, this young Swedish girl, uh, Greta Thunberg, who electrified the world when she said, uh, when she addressed the UN and said, uh, uh, you, uh, she was addressing the delegates and said, you will die of old age, I will die of climate change. See, and, and, <clears throat> I mean, the, the ecological imperative will enforce a transition, either a negative one or a positive one. So that the, the inevitability of transition is one of the characteristics of this historical moment. Uh, but what, how it's shaped is up to what uh, we do. And we need to collaborate with nature instead of dominating it. That's part of the, uh, I think, the secret of a humane uh, transition dynamic. Let me stop there and, and thank you all for a great panel, which I enjoyed very much. Uh, Stuart, you will have the last word, at least for this part, uh, the, 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 the substantive part of our evening. <clears throat> Stuart? Okay, well, I'll try to be brief. I, I have, have a sense of urgency about a different way of thinking and living if we are to imagine a better world. I think it's, um, you know, I'm not sure how long we've got, maybe 10 years, 20, possibly. But uh, in terms of the disappearance of cruelty to people, animals, and the planet. It's crucial uh, to think differently and to uh, behave differently and to learn how to live together differently. That's why I've referred several times to the demise of capitalism and the aggression and violence that is almost taken for granted in, in, in that respect. And I want to refer to um, not only to the points that Hillary made about the feminist movement, but Ponam's point about the small questions as well as the big one. People have to have small big victories on, on a Friday evening to feel confident enough around the world to get up on Monday morning. And, and the, key, the key issue for me in, in crafting a different way of thinking and living is about, um, is about the use of power or the use, uh, the use of violence, or put it the other way around, the use of the fascination with nonviolence. And we haven't mentioned the value of great art and great poetry and great music, but if people want a sense of hope that's been referred to earlier, often you get that from, from inspiration. And from, so we have to talk about localism as well as internationalism. That heads my point about, um, about uh, small victories. And, the, the values are there. I don't, don't know why we ha don't have greater literacy, not just lawyers, but everybody, about the 30 clauses of the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights regarded in 1945 or 1948 as the highest aspirations of common men and women. I mean, there, there is a, a policy blueprint for domestic policies and foreign policies around the globe if we have the kind of dialogue that Chandra and Amin and others have, have spoken to. But I have a sense of urgency. I think it's possible. I think it will make life much more civil and more interesting for everybody around the, around the globe. But we have to think in particular about life enhancing ways of using power 
that harm no one and um, uh, give inspiration possibly to everyone. Uh, thanks very much, Stuart. Uh, before I thank everybody and um, call on both uh, uh, Richard and Stuart to read a short closing poem to uplift our spirits, uh, I just want to mention that the host organization for this event uh, today is a Conversation at the Crossroads, recently established. We're going to have a lot more conversations uh, in which we both listen and speak with each other, uh, both uh, virtual and face-to-face, -face, local, national and international. And we're about to launch soon uh, a series of discussion groups in different locations, who, which will see it as their role to pursue certain issues with a probing eye uh, in depth uh, and over time. So anyhow, there's a lot more to say to, to everyone, but uh, after this event, within the next uh, several days, you'll all get uh, a further email, not only to the hundreds that have uh, joined us uh, this evening, uh, but 300 other registrants who could not be with us because of all kinds of events that intervened, and 300 additional apologies just for this event, which is well in excess of a thousand people. So we're very grateful to those that participated this evening as part of that. So much more to hear, and we're going to ask for your feedback. So please, I know that the enthusiasm can be great at the event, but a day or two or three or four days later, it can uh, wane. Please don't let it wane. Do give us feedback uh, when you send uh, uh, an update on what's happening and what might happen. Okay, so let me end this part by saying thank you, first of all, uh, to those within the group, Conversation at the Crossroads, uh, that have put in a lot of effort to make this possible. And in particular, I want to mention Ben Freeman, who is responsible for the whole technical infrastructure uh, that made the event possible. So thank you, Ben, and all the others, of course. I want to thank our audience, uh, those who have registered but are not with us, and the many who apologized. And uh, I, of course, I want to uh, thank uh, our panelists who have contributed so many insights, so much of their hope and optimism uh, in, for the future at this point of transition. So thank you to one and all. And now to conclude, two short poems. First, from Richard Falk. Uh, I want to read a, a short uh, final stanza of a poem called Dreams by the German poet Gunther Eich. No, don't sleep while the arrangers of the world are busy. Be suspicious of the power they claim to have to acquire on your behalf. Stay awake to be sure that your hearts are not empty when others calculate on the emptiness of your hearts. Do what is unhelpful. Sing songs from out of your mouths that go against expectation. Be ornery. Be as sand, not oil, in the thirsty machinery of the world. Beautiful. Stuart? This quick introduction to, to thank you for being the conductor. You should have a, a white bow tie and tails and a baton, um, Joe, because you've done it uh, incredibly beautifully and elegantly and managed to include uh, everybody, as you, as you have done throughout your professional career. And we're all grateful to that. And I'm thrilled to bits to have seen um, and heard from all our colleague panelists, but in, in particular to Adia Panam, who's done so much in coming from Nepal and achieving so much and reminding us about the powerlessness of women around the world, and a particular connection back to Hanan, who has shown great endurance, stamina, courage, and inspiration for all of us, which is a, almost a blueprint for the future. My, my poem is, is short, it's just one verse, and it's about a 92-year-old 
gentleman in a care home. And he really is an illustration of what everybody can do. Lots of people say, well, I'm only an individual. I can't do anything. This guy wrote for years. He wrote to newspapers about fracking, um, about the destruction of the environment. He wrote about refugees. He wrote about Palestinians. He wrote about the plight of Australian indigenous people. So uh, this, the, the poem is called 92-Year-Old Campaigner. He is the advocate with the deaf a who hears. He is the resident with the spectacles who sees. He is the navigator with humanity's compass who pleads with other citizens to heed the noise from the unfair shore by organizing, speaking, writing about justice. More, more, more. Uh, fitting in to our evening, thank you again to all our panelists, uh, to Hanan and Punam and Hilary, uh, Chandra, and um, uh, to Amin, and uh, of course, uh, to our two wonderful authors. May they write a lot more. Uh, we uh, will spread the word far and wide about the two books and hope that purchases will soar. So it's time to bid you farewell. Keep well till we converse again. Bye. <laughs>